This problem tells us about shockwaves in traffic. I think this problem is a good exercise, because it really requires you to really think about what's happening in the situation, what's going on with all the variables and all the items in the system, which is always an important skill for solving physics problems, or just any sort of problem or question or dilemma, really. In this particular case, uh, the problem tells us something that may seem confusing to some. It mentions that uh, the shockwave itself, the shockwave in the traffic, uh, which, which really is referring to the center of where all these close cars are concentrated, can move either downstream with the flow of the, of the cars of the traffic, or upstream against the flow of the cars. And it might help to think about why exactly this might be. And as you can see here on the left, we've got cars that are moving faster but are distanced farther apart. And then where the shockwave itself actually is, all the cars are closer together and moving more slowly. And you might realize that if these fast-moving cars are entering the pulse faster than the slow-moving cars are leaving it, then the center of where these close cars are concentrated, the shockwave itself, will start to move to the left along the road against the traffic. But if these slow-moving cars are leaving the pulse faster than these fast-moving cars are entering, then uh, this shockwave will start to move to the right. Now this problem asks us to identify D, the distance between each fast-moving car, when the pulse is stationary. So again, we want to think about why this might be. And considering what I just said, the description I just gave about uh, the system and how the pulses could be traveling uh, upstream or downstream, and you might realize that this shockwave here is stationary if the amount of time it takes for one of these fast-moving cars to enter the pulse is the same amount of time that it takes for one of these slow-moving cars to leave the pulse. Or, in terms of this diagram here, in order for the shockwave to remain stationary, then the red car here must take the place of the green car in the same amount of time that it takes for the green car to move one car length forward. So, in other words, by the time this red car, or, or I guess to be more uh, precise here, by the time the front of this red car here takes the place of the front of the green car, then the front of the green car should actually, by that point, be located where the front of the yellow car is. The motion of the green car across a distance L here should take the same amount of time that it takes for the red car to move across this whole distance here of D plus L. So let's first find out what that time is then. Now, as we know, the speed of any motion, v, is equal to the distance that it travels divided by the amount of time it took. Therefore, if we're looking for the time, then we can multiply t by both sides, so that t's cancel out, and then divide both sides by v to realize that the time of any motion is going to be equal to the distance traveled divided by the speed. In this particular case, however, if we're looking for the amount of time it takes for, say, the green car to travel a distance of L, equivalent to the car's length, then that will be equal to L, the distance the front of the car is traveling, divided by V sub S, since that's the speed we're given for the speed of these slow-moving cars within the shockwave. And both of these values were given. L is 12 meters, and Vs is 5 meters per second. So let's plug in those values and we get a time of 2.4 seconds. So that's how long this motion takes. And keep in mind, we want to apply this in some way to find the variable d. So the red car, throughout this entire time period, is traveling distance of d plus l, since it has to travel one distance to get to where the green car is, plus another distance l, so that the front of the car has completely taken the place of where the green car initially was. Now, if d plus l is the total distance that the red car is traveling during this period, then we can once again use algebra and refer back to the v over dt formula to find out what this should be. If we multiply t by both sides of this formula again, 
then we'll realize that d, the distance of any motion, is equal to the speed at which it undergoes that motion, multiplied by the time. Therefore, if the car travels a total distance of d plus l over a course of time, then this is going to be the same as whatever the speed of the car is as it's moving fast, multiplied by the time it takes to move, which we just found. It's 2.4 seconds. Now we can solve for d by subtracting l from both sides, and now we're ready to plug in values, since we have all the values we're given here. It's 25 meters per second for the fast speed of the cars, 2.4 seconds for the time at which the car is moving, minus L, which is the length of the car, 12 meters. So now we just plug in all those values into our new formula here, and we find that D, small d, is equal to 48 meters. In part B, we're asked to solve for the motion of the shock wave if D, the separation of the fast cars, is doubled. So first off, let's double the value we found in part A, 48 meters. And this is equal to 96.0 meters. So now this is the actual separation of the cars in this section of the problem. Now, if we were to keep all other variables of the problem the same, then think about what this would mean for the scenario itself. If the cars are moving at the same speed, or the fast-moving cars, rather, then the fact that they're farther apart means that these cars will be approaching the pulse, well, they'll be approaching the shock wave at a much slower rate overall. The slow-moving cars over here will have more time to move further to the left before a new fast-moving car enters the pulse. Uh, so we can kind of see where this is going. It looks like the pulse is going to be moving further to the right here, and each slow-moving car is going to be able to move farther before uh, the, the fast cars approach. Or, speaking in terms of the diagram here, the green car will be able to move farther before the red car has taken its place. Think about what this means. We decided above, in part A, that VT, the total time it takes for uh, the red car to undergo its motion, is equal to D plus L, where D is the distance between the cars, the separation between them, plus L. And the reason why we added the L there is because that's the distance that the slow car is undertaking before the red car has had a chance to take its place. The reason why we chose L for this in part A was because that had to be the case in order for the shockwave to remain stationary. But now that we're no longer dealing with that scenario, let's define a new variable to represent the distance that the car is undertaken. Or the distance that the slow car is undertaken, rather. I'll call it DS to represent that it's the short distance for the slow cars. In this case, though, we're not dealing with D, the, the, at least not the value we found before. Now we're dealing with 96 meters. And let's try to find what DS actually is. Remember that, as we did in part A, the time that it takes for the slow-moving cars to move uh, this same distance DS can be represented by this here, where that time is equal to the distance it moves divided by its speed, which we're assuming is going to be constant in part A and B. So 5 meters per second. And in order to solve for ds, let's actually represent our formula over here the same way. So let's solve it for t, and then plug in the value for the speed we were given for the fast cars, which is 25 meters per second. The reason why I did that is because since we know that, t, that these t's here are going to be equal, uh, we can set these two formulas equal to one another to try and find ds. And that's what I'm doing here. I've dropped the units just to make this a little bit simpler for the time being. But don't worry, we'll bring them back once we solve for ds. Uh, let's multiply these denominators by each other. And now let's uh, distribute this 5 across the parentheses. We can now get the ds variables on their own by subtracting this 5ds by both sides. And lastly, let's divide both sides by 20 to get ds on its own. And we see that it's equal to 24 meters. This means that the slow-moving car has to travel 24 meters before the fast-moving car takes its initial place. Now that we know this, we can actually solve for the time using the formula we set up earlier, where ds is 24 meters. This means that the time it takes is 4.8 seconds. 
The speed of the shock wave is, well, as the speed of anything is represented, that by the distance it travels divided by the amount of time it takes for it to travel that distance. Now we have found that the distance of one of these slow moving cars at the top here is equal to 24 meters every 4.8 seconds. So you might think that we can find the speed of the shock wave as 24 meters divided by 4.8 seconds. And you would be very, very close, but once again, this goes back to where it really, really helps to carefully consider what's happening in the diagram. Because remember, this 4.8 seconds we found also represents the amount of time it takes for one of these fast-moving cars to approach the shock wave. And the moment one of these fast-moving cars gets to the shock wave, that's adding on a length to the shock wave from the left side. So if we think of the shock wave itself, as the center of the concentration of these uh, cars that are close together, then it has to move to the left a bit once we introduce another fast-moving car here. So while, yes, the slow-moving cars will be traveling uh, 24 meters every 4.8 seconds, the shock wave itself, the, con the central concentration of the pulse, is going to move backwards to the left by the length of one car, during that time interval as well. So we'll actually say minus L. And this will be our real expression here. And of course, plugging our value in for L gives us 12 meters divided by 4.8 seconds. And that is equal to 2.5 meters per second. And that is how fast the shockwave is traveling. The final part of the problem asks us to indicate the direction of the shockwave itself. As we discussed earlier, this is actually fairly intuitive. Since these fast-moving cars are now reaching the pulse at a slower rate, while the slow-moving cars are still leaving the pulse at the same rate, it seems almost self-explanatory that the shockwave is going to be moving uh, to the right, downstream, with the flow of the cars. And this checks out mathematically, too, because we found ds to be 24 meters, which is greater than 12 meters, the length of the car. So if the slow cars are traveling farther than the length of the cars themselves during the time period that it takes for the fast cars to get there, then that alone is even more solid proof that the shockwave is going to be traveling downstream. And there is our answer.